Thank you for joining us for another Hagley History Hangout. My name is Gregory Hargreaves, Program Officer in the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society, the Hagley Museum and Library in Wilmington, Delaware. Now, you know, during these History Hangouts, we like to bring you some of the great research being done by folks, especially folks who have used the Hagley Library collections, but not only, because Hagley has its fingers in all kinds of pies around the business history world, including a book prize, the Hagley Prize. And today, I'm really pleased to be talking with Dr. Tim Yang, Associate Professor at the University of Georgia, and we'll be discussing his Hagley Prize winning book, A Medicated Empire, The Pharmaceutical Industry and Modern Japan. Tim, thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Greg. Um, yeah, it's a great opportunity. And obviously, it's a fantastic honor um, to be awarded the Hagley Prize. Um, I've seen uh, the finalist list, and some of those books are really fantastic. And I'd say in many ways, some are, are uh, better than mine. So just an honor, really. Um, and yeah, the HC has been, uh, I think, really a, a fantastic opportunity to uh, meet new scholars. And um, yeah, thanks so much. Oh, you're very welcome. And uh, you're generous to mention the other uh, contestants as well. Um, but your book was just excellent. It was a real joy to read, and I'm excited to learn some more about it. And let's sort of paint with broad strokes initially. What is your book about? Sure. Um, it's a business history that intervenes into the histories of science and medicine. Um, and the anchor is a company called Hoshi Pharmaceuticals, which is um, which was really one of the um, biggest, most influential drug companies from the late or from the early 20th century um, through the mid 20th century, a little after um, World War II. And I use that as an anchor to examine um, the relationship between pharmaceutical um, companies and the Japanese state um, and its empire, really. So this was a company that had its heyday um, really at a time when research and development was not as important. I think that's one of the major themes um, of the book in the sense that um, after World War II and the post-war development of the drug industry, so much of um, drug development was about developing new synthetic drugs um, in laboratories. And as um, a lot of cultural theorists have um, discussed, um, you know, that laboratory research is, is kind of a, a black box in many ways. And companies, successful ones certainly, write their own company histories. So um, because Hoshi was a company that failed um, and I was able to find a way to access some of the materials, um, I thought this would be a fantastic way to sort of talk about the relationship between um, drug companies and the state and to really talk about um, what has been really an, um, something that hasn't really been discussed much in the historiography of the Japanese empire, which is um, the um, role of business um, and uh, really as an intermediary for um, shaping um, the Japanese regime. So what is it about Hoshi that mm -hmm. made it a really a attractive um, mm -hmm. case study for you in this? Right. Well, well, again, I mentioned, first of all, mm -hmm. that it was a company that failed, right? So the archives were available. Um, and, you know, in, in Japanese um, history, there's this um, subfield called shashi, which is um, business histories. It's essentially, it's a big sort of group of historians. They do excellent histories. And the um, University of Pittsburgh has this fantastic library um, collection that um, just talks about and Heather has, um, you know, just promotes Shashi and there's actual journal about um, business history. And um, I thought, well, you know, I, I, I thought this would be an interesting way to intervene in that, right? And also in the fact that medicine um, has been such an important subfield and also the history of um, East Asia as well. Um, a lot of the history is about, you know, how does Japan become modern? How does East Asia become modern? And one of the ways in which it does so is through medicine. Um, but the relationship of business to that hasn't really been talked about that. So I thought this is a fantastic way to, to do this. Um, Hoshi also, um, it's a company that um, 
still remains the Japanese zeitgeist in a way. Um, the uh, founder's son is Hoshi Shinichi, who is, um, if some of you might know, maybe likely not considering um, the audience of this podcast, but he's one of the most uh, famous post-war uh, science fiction authors. And he had written um, some nonfiction works talking about this company to his um, to his readers. And so was, and if you mentioned Hoshi Shinichi in Japan, everybody knows who he is and this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, also the company manufactured medicines that um, really cover um, the gamut of different types of medicines with their symbolic resonances and other things. What I mean by that is that um, it was heavily involved in the opium trade, which um, you know certainly has um, this resonance in the history of East Asia with the opium war and this sort of thing, um, seen as being um, used by you know degenerates and tied to tropes of addiction and um, yellow fever, this sort of thing tied to Asian American immigration and like the dangers of that and this sort of thing. Um, it had its hands in patent medicines, right, which. Um, were like sort of the over the counters of today in many ways, right? And the danger of those sorts of medicines was that um, these were overly commodified, right? They're like mm -hmm. sold as, you know, not really much different than, you know, widgets or like, you know, uh, a water bottle or, uh, you know, any sort of thing, right? They're just like, what the, what's important about them essentially is the ways in which they are marketed, right? And advertised and sold and that sort of thing. Right, so then that sort of questions these companies as well. And it was heavily involved in, in medicines that were seen as being um, uniquely humanitarian, right? And that's sort of the idea mm -hmm. that drug companies promote is this idea that the companies are more than for-profit enterprises, right? And what, what, you know, it, to me, it's sort of like, well, kind of obvious, well, clearly it's for-profit, right? But that's the, the symbolism of these things. So, so quinine was, you know, the, the anti-malarial drug, which was, supremely important. Um, Daniel Hedrick, right, in his book on tools of empire, talks about quinine as being essential for the colonization of, of the non-West, right? Um, South Asia, Southeast Asia, um, Latin America, et cetera, this sort of thing. The ability to protect the colonizers from uh, malaria and this sort of thing. So this company um, had its hands in a variety of medicines um, and had these ties to um, the Japanese state um, and its archives were available in many ways. So, um, and there's also, I guess, something that, that might not be so obvious until you actually read the book is that um, the founder, um, he was uh, trained at Columbia University. Um, he had a political science degree um, and there's, um, you know, his heavily influenced by the progressive era um, so history of the US and the ways in which um, corporations um, developed um, in the United States, looking at arguments of, you know, how can corporations do good, this sort of thing. Also heavily um, involved in being a proselytizer of Taylorism and scientific management. So all of these different sort of things, the ways in which become sort of this vector for translating different ideas, um, for bringing over different types of medicines, this sort of thing. Um, I thought this would be a, a perfect um, way to write a book that connects business to medicine in that sort of way. Absolutely. Um, it, one of the things I really enjoyed about reading your book is it is a history of a firm, but mm -hmm. so much more. And you use that right. uh, that touchstone to mm -hmm. branch out in so many other directions to explain these right. connections. Mm -hmm. I think it's really, really effective. Right. Would you perhaps for our listeners uh, give the narrative arc of sure. the book? Yeah. Um, so, so I begin with um, basically the uh, a summary of um, the state of the um, medicinal marketplace in Japan. And, you know, it's, there's these um, traditional medicines based on Chinese herbal traditions. Um, there's also in late 19th, early 20th century Japan, this is when Japan, um, you know, first opened in a way, opening um, is a euphemism. Um, the US, um, Commodore Matthew Perry sort of opens up Japan for trade, really sort of semi-colonization. and. Um, the new Japanese state after the fall of the Tokugawa regime um, 
sort of takes this 180 in the sense of wanting to become modern and sort of mimic may not be the exact word and I sort of may get in trouble with some of my um, Japanese historian colleagues of saying that, but certainly trying to learn from other mm. Western regimes, right? Mm. So mm -hmm. um, there would be, um, you know, uh, scholars and bureaucrats and politicians within travel the world to say Great Britain and the United States and France, but also other places, you know, South Asia, et cetera, to look at the ways in which other states became modern. And medicine was part of that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I sort of lay that out, all of this in the first chapter and sort of the ways in which um, medicine um, becomes used by the Japanese state, its importance for um, its own civilizing project for creating a nation state and an empire, um, but also the ways in which the Jap the uh, Japanese pharmaceutical industry becomes a strategic industry. So um, the way in which capitalism develops in Japan was top down mostly because of um, it, it, the, the leading um, politicians and bureaucrats were they're Listians in many ways, right? They weren't so much following um, free market sort of ideas because they felt that's what Japan needed to do was catch up with the world. So the early state promoted strategic industries like shipbuilding and steel. And I say that, well, what pharmaceuticals was kind of part of that actually, because you needed medicines, right? Um, to keep your bodies healthy, right? Promoting like a, a literal and, met and uh, metaphorical body politic, right? So I'm trying to create a state essentially, right? So medicines were vitally important in that sense. And I talk about how they're the state was heavily involved um, with a very visible hand in promoting the pharmaceutical industry. And then I, then I go into a deep dive into Hoshi, right? That's the next chapter of, um, you know, where did this guy come from? I mentioned before that he, um, a lot of the ways in which Hoshi Pharmaceuticals became successful was through him and his connections to the Japanese um, state's leaders, right? And a lot of that was through, um, his ability to travel, his ability to go to the United States, um, meet people. Um, he was, um, I said before, educated at Columbia, got an MA there. Um, and his first occupation was actually a journalist and a newspaper man. And he founded a, um, a, a newspaper called Japan in America. So sort of um, introduced Japanese elites to American ones and American ones to Japanese ones. And it was through that connection of being an in-between person who could like translate both sides that he's then able to access um, you know, key people in the Japanese state, um, which then become extraordinarily useful for founding his company, right? So then I talk about you know, the, the making of the company, um, how through these personal connections, um, Hoshi is able to then begin manufacturing medicines, um, becomes a patent medicine maker originally, right? And um, then is also able to then gain access to the uh, Japanese state's colonial regime in Taiwan through his connections. And that's where he gets this opium connection, right? And also later is able to um, manufacture quinine because one of part of the projects that I talk about um, was this company's involvement in um, growing cinchona, which is the raw material for quinine um, mm -hmm. in Taiwan um, and yeah, all that sort of thing. So I talk about that, talk about then it, it's so that's you know, part one, essentially the making of this firm in relationship to the state. Um, part two of the book is um, the, it's a commodity history essentially. So I talk about three different commodities, right? Um, patent medicines, um, then opium, and then um, quinine, right? So the dangers of patent medicines and how the state felt that, well, you know, can we really have a modern medical regime that people will trust if you have firms creating these products and selling these products as everyday goods? So, so this is one of these stories of, um, you know, pharmaceuticals in general of, the dangers of patent medicine, right? And um, Toadstool Millionaires is um, James Scott Harvey's famous book from the 1960s, right? Um, so there's this sort of parallel sort of history, right? In all these other nations at a similar time um, that Japan has this sort of parallel story of what does the state do about um, 
these medicines that are sold as consumer goods. And, you know, there's a story of regulation here of like, you know, um, the, the Japanese state creates something parallel to the FDA, right, this sort of thing. Um, and I talk about, you know, how um, Hoshi through these patent medicines is able to, um, you know, serve as an intermediary for promoting different ideas of hygiene and public health, right, but also how that you know, it doesn't really answer the question of, you know, are these medicines like trustworthy or not? And so we're sort of like um, towing the line the company is, right, of, of like, you know, or do these things actually work or not and, and this sort of thing, right? Um, so I talk about advertising, I talk about marketing, um, and then the next chapter talks about the spaces in which these goods are sold. So in a way, it's sort of like zooming in on the creation of Walgreens in a way, but it's like through Hoshi, right? Something like that. And, and Hoshi was actively looking at companies like Walgreens and Rexall and other ways in which, you know, franchising worked. And the idea was to create a space in which consumers would feel free to purchase their medicines, right? Highly tied to, um, you know, the rise of department stores, right? This sort of thing. Um, and sort of, you know, how do you create this idea that consumers can freely choose their medicines? And, you know, in Japan, this was so radical in many ways, and it seems so normative and kind of boring from the U.S. perspective. We're like, well, yeah, this is like, you know, whatever, down the street drugstore, any other sort of Rite Aid or any other thing. But um, the ways in which medicines were sold um, from um, say the 15th, 16th century through uh, the mid 19th um, was through um, these sort of very closed stores in which you have to first like go and sit down on these like mats, these tatami sort of mats. Um, you probably know what they look like, right? So these like sort of like bamboo straw mats and you first have to talk to um, the store clerk, right? Who then is able to then prescribe in many ways, right? what kind of medicine you need, but it's kind of very intimidating, right? And you don't really know, you know it, it's a very like weird sort of um, feeling in a way. It's very, very like, you know, strange and um, close. And, and there's barriers that, there. Yeah, there's barriers, that's the idea, right? So it's the idea of like sort of breaking down these barriers and having these like shops with, you know, open um, aisles and, and display cases and other sorts of things to give people the idea that they can purchase these sort of things. And it's all part of this idea of promoting this modern idea, right, for selling these sort of things, right? Mm -hmm. So the spaces are vitally important. And I talk about the training of the franchisees and the store clerks through Taylorism and other sorts of things. And, um, you know, the ways in which, um, you know, on the ground, right, the, the you know, whom you talk to in the store is so vitally important for um, figuring out what medicine to buy um, and sort of, you know, they're the vectors on the ground that people encounter, the consumers. So I, I talk about how these are these guys are trained and a lot of them are actually women, they're not guys um, because, um, you know, there are all sorts of different ailments and certain, you know, ways in which, you know, women's bodies are different, right, obviously, right? and. The idea was to promote that sort of sense where, you know, the housewife could sort of go in and just sort of purchase these sort of things. And, hmm. and in Japan, the idea was the, the, the key vector of consumer capitalism was the housewife, not so much the, um, the, the male sort of, you know, working sort of um, paternalistic figure. So that was the person traditionally, the, the housewife who, you know, held the purse strings and this sort of thing and control the family finances and this sort of thing. Um, so the idea was, you know, how did drug firms, you know, promote this thing? And that's what I discussed mm -hmm. in that sort of chapter and mm -hmm. the ways in which also, like if you have, um, you know, people who are not well-trained, right? People um, who then um, may, you know, be selling not Hoshi goods, but other sorts of goods, right? And sort of what happens there. Um, so again, on the these sort of on the ground sort of ways in which um, medicine um, that are, are, yeah, medicines are intermediaries, right, it's that mm -hmm. chapter. Um, after that, I move on to opium. Um, opium um, through the Japanese state um, and how, um, you know, in, in the history of East Asia, you know, it's the opium wars, which was the trigger for Western imperialism, right, the fall of China and this sort of thing. And, 
I know Japan was opened up after China, right? And a lot of the Japanese um, state leaders were worried about becoming China. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to then differentiate themselves from the Chinese, right? So opium is banned, right? Um, except for medicinal purposes in Japan from the late 19th through the early 20th century, and it's still heavily um, regulated. And I think a lot of the ways in which the Japanese state um, today is still um, so strict about narcotics and other illegal you know, medicines you know, comes from this sort of period. So like the famous story is um, John Lennon couldn't get into Japan. Right, because he had marijuana on him, that sort of thing. You don't let John Lennon in, something's you know up. So that that's <laughs> right. Of thing, right. Even today, or or in the 1970s, we'll say, because John Lennon obviously has passed away. Um, but anyway, so opium um, is vitally important, right? Um, as this um, way to talk about modern East Asian history, Japanese history, Chinese history, etc. What Japan does, which is a bit different, is that Japan, um, the state prohibits um, the consumption of opium in the home islands for Japanese citizens, mm -hmm. but then seems to be promoting the recreational use of opium in its colonies, uh, particularly in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And so as the Japanese state is saying that it's trying to civilize the Japanese people, civilize the people that it colonizes, um, it's also sort of selling, becoming sort of a, a, uh, a drug dealer, right? Um, to its colonized peoples and manufacturing its own opium, this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, the Japanese state claims that it's doing so um, for humanitarian reasons because you need to sort of wean these addicts, right? From opium, you can't just, um, have them stop cold turkey. Um, but what actually was going on was that a lot of the early finances for Japan's colonial regime, particularly in Taiwan, um, Japan takes over Taiwan in 1895 after winning the Sino-Japanese War. Um, Japan finances a lot of the uh, early colonization, particularly its public health programs through the sale of opium actually, because mm -hmm. it was capital poor. And obviously doesn't, you know, the state doesn't talk about this. Um, so Hoshi's involved in this and Hoshi's involved in um, sort of procuring Turkish opium for the um, opium refiners in Taiwan, right? Hoshi also is able to then purchase um, the uh, crude morphine, which comes from sort of refining um, opium into uh, morphine for recreational purposes and for medicinal purposes, but the crude morphine then it takes and monopolizes that for domestic consumption and also becomes a seller of um, morphine um, for medicinal use for other countries and this sort of thing. So Hoshi is like, you know, this in-between company um, that is sort of um, in both the licit marketplace, right, which it claims to be doing, but then it gets into this um, opium scandals, so it's clearly involved also in illicit opium trading as well. And what it claims to be doing, um, which I think is the case of nearly all pharmaceutical firms um, involved in narcotics, is simply, you know, where does this stuff come from? Well, it comes from illicit sources, but they sell it off and they claim that their hands are, are, are clean afterwards, right? So what I mean by this is that 1970s, um, you know, the, the center of the illicit drug trade of Heroin was uh, New York. You know what was the primary reason for that? Well, certainly, um, you know New York's the node for trade. But where's the pharmaceutical industry located in the U.S. Right, um, suburbs of New York, New Jersey, this sort of thing. Um, so Hoshi was involved in that, and and mm -hmm. Hoshi becomes mm -hmm. implicated um, in this sort of trade, and that leads to his downfall. Um, and I have a, another chapter about um, the financial troubles it's involved in, um, how this opium um, scandal then leads to the freezing of finances and um, its whole scheme of growing its, um, yeah, it, it's a medicated empire, right, to, to pun the book, um, sort of collapses because of, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's money, it's sort of, uh, it, it's, it's money stream is sort of frozen and, you know, people are wondering what is it about this company, right, this sort mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, 
um, talk about labor strikes and other sorts of things, and, and trademark scandals, which is vitally important. Also, talk about the history of medicine of, um, you know, what is it about trademarks, right? You know, patents and this sort of thing, and can you patent a medicine, right? This is one of still, you know, one of the major issues when you talk about medicines, right? Is mm -hmm. it uh, morally responsible to patent a medicine or not, and this sort of thing. Um, so um, I talk about that in this uh, in the chapter of Hoshi's downfall of. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what really mattered to Hoshi was not so much, you know, the medicines that were trademarked, but, you know, really, you know, the trademark itself, the branding again, right? And then the, the last section of the book talks about uh, the production of quinine, essentially, um, mostly focused on colonial Taiwan, uh, talk about Peru, um, and how Hoshi was involved in purchasing land from um, the Peruvian state um, in order to, you um, create these plantations in the Andes mountains and sort of this uh, linkage between um, Peru and Taiwan for manufacturing medicinal plants, which included um, not just quinine, but um, you know other things like coca and for cocaine, this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and you know the, the key point for the, the this third final section of the book was that you know, even the production of um, something that's seen as being so humanitarian valuable involve the domination of human lives. Um, specifically, what I'm talking about is um, Hoshi was heavily reliant on Aboriginal labor, right, in the mountains of Taiwan for producing um, quinine and this sort of thing. Um, and you know, the last, you know, sort of the, the really last section of the book talks about, you know, the, the wartime period, how um, a lot of the medicines manufactured by Hoshi, specifically the narcotics and um, you know, the uh, alkaloid, other alkaloid plants like um, cinchona for um, quinine were uh, essential for the Japanese war effort, right? So for keeping soldiers alive, um, dulling their pain, right? Surgeries and this sort of thing during the wartime period. Um, and you know, the, the narrative ends with an epilogue in um, the post-World War II period of the U.S. occupation of Japan, mm -hmm. um, when Hoshi then uh, tries to revive itself, but under the U.S. occupation, the U.S. is concerned about the opium trade um, and issues a directive to the major drug firms in Japan that they can't start producing any narcotics. Hoshi does produce narcotics, and when there's an investigation of Hoshi, Hoshi gets caught and can't produce, is told that it has to shut down production, and that sort of leads to um, its real downfall. One of the themes that just keeps coming up in different ways throughout the book is the position of the middleman or position mm -hmm. in between things. Mm -hmm. Both the founder of the firm mm -hmm. is able to translate between uh, yep. different spheres. The firm itself acts as a hinge between yeah. a domestic market and an international and imperial context. Could you yeah. perhaps elaborate on, yeah. um, on that theme and yeah. how it, it becomes very useful for you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that is one of, yeah, without doubt, perhaps the theme of the book, right, is this interconnectedness, right? And, you know, when, when you write books, there's, um, you know, certain inspirations you get, right? And I think one of the uh, primary ones when I was writing this um, book, and it, it began as a dissertation, and then you know went into various sort of forms. Um, but but one of the primary inspirations was um, the anthropologist Anna Singh's book called Friction, which is a, a history of um, global connection, um, and she talks about um, production of rubber in Southeast Asia connected to global firms, and then connected to you know, environmental, you know, disaster and this sort of thing. And, and the idea was that, you know, how, how do ideas travel? How do, um, you know, things translate? Well, it's through the hands, largely speaking, in the modern world of, of capitalists, right? And mm -hmm. I figured, well, this is, this is a capitalist right here. This is, this is Hoshi, right? This is Hoshi Hajime, um, who is, you know, a person who has access, right? Special access, and he's able to act as this go-between. So, um, you know, that was one of the major themes. Um, this idea of um, commodity histories, right? And commodity histories themselves are histories of connection in many ways, right? And this is so, you know, the Hoshi is, you know, sort of 
um, the anchor for different commodity histories of different substances of you know, opium and patent medicines and other sorts of things. So it, it's all about connecting to different types of interests and people and uh, forms of, you know, ideas and, you know, capital and, you know, talk about almost anything through a commodity, right? So, <laughs> so Sidney Mintz, obviously, right, um, the anthropologist, right, he's written about sugar, um, right? Oil and Palm was one of the podcasts that I listened to when I was um, um, sort of, you know, Know, talking, thinking about how I could talk about, you know, this book, you know, for the Hagley Hangout, um, mm -hmm. right? So another one of these excellent sort of podcasts that, that you've done. Um, and you, know, you really can do anything from a commodity history because that's what commodities are. They connect things, right? Um, it's a history of connectedness. And mm -hmm. so, so for me, the challenge of this book was, right, it's centered, it's anchored, yet it could explode into all these sorts of places, right? And that's really what this book is in many ways. And it's like, how do I contain it? Essentially, was the question for me. Well, I think you were really successful in capturing that richness and mm -hmm. containing it between two covers. And uh, Tim, thank you so much for sharing your work with me today. All right. Thank you, Greg. It's a pleasure. Well, you're welcome. And for the audience, if you would like more Hagley History Hangouts, more information on the Center for the History of Business, Technology, and Society at the Hagley Museum and Library, join us online at hagley.org. That's H-A-G-L-E-Y dot O-R-G. Don't be a stranger. <laughs>